This is the Boeing 767, by far the largest jet that I've ever had the chance to fly, and it has a really interesting history. Did you know it actually was designed to have a third tail-mounted engine? Some of the components from that original design are still inside the airplane today. So we're gonna dive deep inside and outside of this legendary jet. United was the first airline to introduce the Boeing 767 in 1982, and in the 40 years since, it's been a high density and high premium airplane, flying between major cities in the United States and to large cities, mid-sized cities, and even seasonal destinations internationally. You can find our Boeing 767s flying on routes as short as Newark to Chicago, or as long as Houston to Munich, Houston to Rio de Janeiro, and Newark to Honolulu. As of 2022, United flies 37 767-300s and 16 767-400s. In the early 1970s, the 7X7 program was created by Boeing to replace the Boeing 707 with a mid-sized twin-aisle aircraft. Early variants included a third tail-mounted engine, in part due to pre-ETOPS regulations which required three or more engines for oceanic crossings. Due to this initial design, all 767s have a center hydraulic system and some components from a center pneumatic system. Designed in conjunction with the 7N7, which would later become the 757, both airplanes became the first Boeing jets designed with high-bypass turbofan engines, glass cockpits with color displays, and ICAST monitoring systems to replace a third crew member, the flight engineer, which were found on most jets at the time. In the early 1980s, some 767s were delivered with a flight engineer seat and panel due to airline and union demands. Despite some major systems and size differences, the 757 and 767 share a type rating because the flight deck is similar enough for safe operations, so I've found myself flying both in the same day on domestic trips. To date, over 1,200 767s have been built, and Boeing is still producing freight and refueling variants. The 767-300 is 180 feet long, 52 feet high, and has a wingspan of 166 feet. And when we're sitting in the flight deck as pilots, our eye level is 18 feet above the ground, which of course is even higher when we're in the flare. Now the 767-400 is 20 feet longer and has a slightly larger wingspan of 170 feet due to raked wingtips. On our 767-300, the maximum takeoff weight is 407,000 pounds, and with a maximum fuel load in the left, center, and right tanks of 170,000 pounds, we can fly a maximum range of just under about 6,000 miles. Now, at United, the longest flight we're operating currently on this airplane is from Munich to Houston at 5,400 miles and 11 hours and 30 minutes of flight time. All right, so taking a look inside the cabin, the cabin on the 767 is 15 and a half feet wide. And depending on the configuration, we can seat anywhere from 167 to 240 passengers. The interesting thing about it is that the cabins vary widely between aircraft. There are different sections for Polaris and Premium Plus, different door configurations, but we can go back and take a look back through Premium Plus and Polaris. This is the Premium Plus cabin, which is actually one of the biggest growing markets for the airline. It's a really good mix between economy seating and Polaris seating, where you have more room, you have linens, better meal service, to be able to get through a longer flight. It's a really great option for people that don't wanna spend quite as much as Polaris, but still wanna get comfortable rest on the way over. Now this is the High J767, so the economy cabin is actually, this is it. It's a pretty small cabin with only 99 seats. And then moving to the back, when the flight is long enough and the flight attendants have crew rest, this is actually where their crew rest area is. A curtain goes all the way around these seats and they have tons of seat controls to be able to add sort of a massive recline, have a footrest that comes out and there's tons of legroom in these seats. 
One thing that's kind of cool is if you're flying on a United 767 domestically and the flight attendants aren't in crew rest, these are some of the best seats actually on the airplane, the last two seats on the left side of the economy cabin. At the back of the airplane is the biggest galley, so we have tons of room for catering back here, multiple coffee machines. This is where a lot of the busiest action happens for flight attendants. And when I'm flying as an international relief officer or IRO, you actually come all the way to the back before boarding to check the water quantity and the different lav levels um, to make sure that the waste service has been done before you take the airplane overseas. This is one of the jobs of the, uh, the IRO when we're flying internationally. On the 767-300, seat 1A is our crew rest seat. I actually like it. It's a pretty comfortable seat, and right in front of it, we have a crew rest curtain that goes all the way around the seat on a track. It's pretty easy to set up on the 300, actually, and it slides all the way back around. And when it's closed, it actually closes using magnets. So it's really easy to sort of get set up um, to help us get good rest on those longer flights. Most of our 300s are actually configured in my favorite configuration, which is called High J. About half of the floor space for the entire 767 is a premium cabin, either 46 Polaris business seats or 22 premium plus seats. And then we have a smaller economy section behind that that's only 99 passengers for a total of 167 passengers. That's actually 67 less seats than the single aisle 757-300 that I also fly. You can find these airplanes flying to and from London on some of our most premium routes. Actually, my favorite seat in Polaris is a window seat on the inside, which is this one. It gives you a little bit more privacy than being on the aisle where the aisle's sort of right next to you. So it's a pretty cool cabin. Walking around the 767 really is like any other airplane. From day one of flight training, when you were a student pilot, your instructor taught you how to walk around looking for damage, leaks, dents, missing parts. It's all the same stuff we're looking for, just on a much bigger airplane. Now, on very first flight on IOE, your LCA will go ahead and walk around the airplane with you and show you some specific parts, but it's a big airplane, so it takes a while to walk around. Our 767-300s are powered by two massive Pratt & Whitney 4060 engines, each producing 60,000 pounds of thrust. Now, with such a big airplane, we do have a really big set of landing gear. And I don't know if you've noticed, but on the 767, they tilt forward until touchdown. Now, the reason I think that that could happen, and I've heard a few different stories for why that happens, what I've heard most commonly is that it has to do with fitting into the wheel wells. When the landing gear goes up into the wheel wells, it actually goes in at an angle. And so the tilt of the landing gear is actually designed just so that it will physically fit up into the airplane. On the wing of the 767, we actually have two ailerons. So we have an outboard aileron and an inboard aileron. And at low speeds, both ailerons are functioning to give us as pilots maximum roll authority. But there's an aileron lockout system at high speeds, which locks out the outer aileron to prevent over controlling in flight. All right, so looking at the flight deck, on the 7.6, we actually step up into the flight deck. And it's a pretty big space, actually. So we have two jump seats. One of our jump seaters, or our IRO, International Relief Officer, will sit here. We have a maintenance panel that's sort of reminiscent of older jets, where we had a flight engineer seat. And then we also have a second jump seat that's behind the door over in that corner. It's a pretty big space, and actually, if you notice, on longer flights, I can stand up all the way in the flight deck, and when people need to stretch and get up to sort of keep themselves awake a little bit on longer flights, we'll do it right here. We can stand right up in the flight deck, which is pretty cool. Okay, I know the flight deck might look a little antiquated and a little complex, but it's actually not that bad. So we're gonna do a quick walkthrough of where everything kind of is. On the upper left side, we have our IRS selectors. That's helping determine our position. There's three of them that we bring into nav before flight. We have all of our hydraulic systems. And then up here, we have an overhead crew alerting system that has lights for the access doors and things like that. And then all of our electrical panels. So battery controls, APU and external power, all of those controls are here. 
On the bottom section of the overhead panel is all of the exterior lighting, so wing lighting, taxi lighting, all of those things. And then up here we have our engine controls, so our start selectors, our fuel controls, our fuel jettison, which is on the 767 only, wing anti-ice, and then up here we have window heat and cargo heat. Internal and external communications are sort of right in this section. So we get alerted when there's a cell call from ATC, or if we have a cabin call and from which zone in the cabin the flight attendants are calling. Our seatbelt sign is right there. And then we have our uh, pressurization panel to determine cabin altitude for our landing airport. Over here is all of the air and pneumatic section. So bleeds, temperature controls, all of that good stuff. The MCP or mode control panel is sort of the meat of the airplane, right? So on the left side, we have all of our auto throttle controls and then everything in between is what you'll find in other airplanes for selecting heading, speed, altitude, vertical speed, engaging the autopilot. Moving down to the center part of the flight deck, we have our two ICAST screens, the engine indication and crew alerting system, as well as status pages. So we can see where the flight controls are during checklists and things like that. All of our status messages, alerts, warnings, cautions, those are all things that pop up on our ICAST controls. We also have two CDUs that have FMCs and ACARs built in for external communications. And then looking at sort of my flight controls, right, when you're coming up to actually flying the airplane, I have a PFD and MFD. It actually is kind of interesting because in many airplanes, the MFD is to the side and a lot bigger. So for me to see the MFD, that's sort of how Boeing determines the seat position. So you're far enough forward and high enough to be able to see that MFD. One thing that's kind of interesting, because this is an older airplane, right, is that we actually do have speed tape on the PFD, but on our airspeed indicator, we have these little knobs that we move around, these little notches that determine, um, and we go ahead and put on our VR speed, our V1 speed, our flaps five maneuvering speed, and our clean maneuvering speed. And those are things that we actually physically set on the airspeed indicator. It's sort of like an old style uh, throwback from when there was no airspeed tape giving us those speeds. And actually, even today, we still don't have an altitude tape on the PFD. We just have sort of an old traditional style altimeter. So it's not that hard to learn. Um, it's interesting coming off of glass cockpits and then coming into an airplane like this that's a little bit more dated, but it's very easy to get used to in my opinion. Everything else in the center is kind of as you would imagine. We have our two throttles with thrust reverse, speed brakes, a flap control, fuel control switches that we bring to run when we're starting the engines, and then our VHF comm. All of these old panels, another old thing on the 767, have these old style toggle switches to control volume on the radios. And then we have our trim TCAS uh, systems for transponder and also our weather uh, radar systems as well. Wrapping things up in the flight deck, we have a massive section of circuit breakers way up over here. And then we also have a circuit breaker panel back here behind the first officer's seat, sort of to the right of the jump seater, both here and also down underneath that panel. The 767-400 flight deck has updated instrument panels with large LCD screens that replace traditional instruments in old cathode ray tube screens. Now in terms of actually physically flying the airplane, I was shocked by how light on the controls this airplane is. People describe this sort of like driving an old Buick except with double the power steering. So really slow and steady, but also very light on the controls. You might be surprised that compared to the 757, this thing requires about half of the physical effort during rotation to get it into the sky. So it's very light, it's very easy to fly. Um, and then when we're actually in cruise, we're doing about a maximum of Mach 0.82, which burns 5,000 pounds, just over 5,000 pounds per engine. In terms of landing the airplane, when we come down and I hear the radio altimeter say 30, that's when we start our flare and start to walk the power back to idle very slowly. Um, and normally the idle power will come in at about 10 feet. On our 400s with the GE engines, the power will actually come back a little slower, just below 30 feet, um, and trying to be idle just before touchdown. That has to do with the spool down time on the engines. Honestly, this is just such a cool plane and I feel very lucky to be able to fly it so early in my career. And they're gonna be around for a long time, so I hope that you get the chance to fly on one. Now, the 757 is a totally different beast, but I'll save that for another video.